we begin our service with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace in Jesus Christ, for knowledge of your word, and for power through your Holy Spirit to speak the message of the cross to those who do not know you and are perishing in their sins. We thank you, O Lord, for the privilege and the opportunity to serve Christ as his ambassador. Help us to rejoice today in worship and always in our own salvation with a godly desire to serve you as we spread your word to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. rise. This Sunday is the fifth Sunday after Trinity, and on this Sunday we continue to focus on God's work in and for us. Today our meditation will be focusing on how God continues to work to instruct or to train us in our lives here as he describes for us what he has done for us and what he also desires to work in us. This morning we'll be following the order of service as it is found in the green insert inside your bulletin. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. 
If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. But we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, renew us by your Holy Spirit, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven. With boldness and confidence, we may approach the throne to find grace to help in the time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this fifth Sunday after Trinity is found recorded for us in the words of the prophet Jeremiah as he records the words of the Lord to his Old Testament people. Many times as we read through the scriptures, we hear what it is that God desires for us or of us. But there's one thing for us to have a desire or for God to have a desire, and it's another for that desire to be carried out. In the case of God, he doesn't just desire our salvation, but he has done everything that is necessary in order to accomplish his desire for us with our salvation as well as our sanctification. In these verses from Jeremiah chapter 16, we'll hear how it's the Lord's desire to bring not just some people, but all people to the knowledge of salvation that he has accomplished through the work of Christ. We're reading from Jeremiah 16, beginning with verse 14. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands where he has driven them. For I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. And first, I will repay double for their iniquity and their sin, because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable idols. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Our second reading is found recorded for us in the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 26. Once again, we see this theme of instruction being brought out as Jesus uses different ways of educating not just his disciples, but also others. 
Many times he will do that by asking questions in order to get people to critically think about what it is that Jesus is speaking. And other times he uses events in the lives of the people around him. We're reading from Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Here ends our gospel reading. Please rise. We join to confess our faith, joining with those Christians throughout the centuries as we confess our faith in the God who does continue to instruct and teach us in the way of salvation. We'll be using this morning the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of the next hymn, hymn 774. <laughs>
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That grows in these areas of of Europe and Asia. Now, I did say grows. What's interesting about these rocks is that they grow and they move. They're called living rocks. There's a very special chemical inside the rock that when they're rained on, they absorb the minerals from the rain and a chemical reaction takes place inside the rock that causes it to expand. Now these rocks can continue to expand and they have been found to be as much as 30 feet in diameter. When they get to be so big, many times they will actually break off of whatever is holding them in place and they will roll to a different location giving them the idea of, or the look look of moving. Now these are living rocks, they're called. They're not really alive, but they have some of the characteristics of being alive in that they grow and that they move. In the verses of our text for today, the Apostle Peter uses a very similar picture. He too talks about living stones in a different sense than we see with these travants. He uses these living stones to describe the building project that the Lord is constructing throughout the era of humanity. That building project begins with Jesus himself, the very cornerstone, the very first of the living stones upon which believers are built upon. We read our text from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. Coming to him... As to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. This is the word of our God. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who takes living stones in order to build his temple, dear fellow redeemed. The verses of our text for this morning, the Apostle Peter is describing this building project of the Lord using living stones. And we'll see two different groups of these living stones. We have, first of all, Jesus himself, who is the living stone, the cornerstone of the building project. And upon that cornerstone, Peter also describes individual believers, those who trust in Jesus as their Savior, 
as also living stones built upon that cornerstone, built into God's special and holy temple, what we often call the Holy Christian Church. We pray that the Spirit would bless our study this morning as we consider these two parts of God's building project using living stones. The Apostle Peter probably never visited Eastern Romania either. And yet he uses this very vivid illustration in order to help us to understand what is taking place in this building project. In the opening verse of our text, Peter says, coming to him, that is to Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones. And then he goes on. Coming to him, to Jesus, as to a living stone. Well, Peter tells us that many people throughout the centuries have rejected Jesus as this living stone, as the cornerstone of the church. But he says that Jesus is three things. He begins by saying that he is chosen by God. This living stone, Jesus himself, was chosen by God for a very specific purpose. Think back earlier into our service when we had the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 16. Remember that just outside of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had asked his disciples, who is it that men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the disciples had given him an answer. They said, well, some people say that you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead, or Elijah, maybe Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets of the Old Testament. But that wasn't the right answer. Jesus then asked, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter made that wonderful profession of faith. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. That word Christ in the Greek is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah. And both Messiah and Christ have the meaning of the anointed one, the one that was chosen by God for a very specific purpose. Peter, who made that confession of Jesus being the Christ, brings that out in the verses of our text, saying that Jesus was chosen by God. God chose him for a very specific purpose, to be the Savior of the world. He was the anointed one. He was the one who came to do exactly what God needed him to do. Jesus as that living stone was chosen by God. Peter also says that Jesus was precious, chosen by God and precious. If you go down just a little bit further in our text in verse six, Peter actually quotes from an Old Testament Bible passage. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. You'll notice that these are in quotation marks. And in that verse from Isaiah, Isaiah writes, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, or chosen, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. When I was a kid, one year for Christmas, my parents got me a rock tumbler. Do you remember those? They were these little machines that had a door on them, and you would go out and collect rocks of different kinds. They could be ugly horrible, all kinds of sharp edges on them, and you throw them in the rock tumbler, and you turn it on, and you let it run for a while, and it, it smooths out all of those rough edges, and it rounds it off, and it polishes it. I remember with that rock tumbler, it came with directions for how you could take an ugly piece of rock and turn it into a beautiful piece of jewelry or a keychain or something along those lines. You could take a, just a normal rock, and turn it into something special, something precious. Well, that's not exactly the way Peter is describing Jesus. Jesus isn't something rough and rugged and ugly that becomes something that is precious as a result of some process that takes place. Jesus is precious in and of himself. 
If you think about who Jesus was and the fact that he was chosen by God for a very specific purpose to become the Savior, he was the only kind of Savior that would actually do, that would be able to accomplish what it was that God required of him to do for our salvation. Jesus was both true God and true man. And this is one of those distinctions within Christianity that separates it from all of the other religions of the world. There are a lot of religions in the world that will offer a supposed solution for getting to heaven or resolving the problem of sin, but they're all work righteous in nature. They all require you to do something. Christianity says, no, God has done that for you in the person of Jesus, and only one Savior would be able to accomplish that salvation. That Savior would have to be both true God and true man. He would have to take our place and be just like us to be our acceptable substitute under the law of God. But in order for his work of salvation to be acceptable for all of humanity, he also had to be true God. Jesus was unique. He was precious. The God-man, he was exactly what we as human beings, sinful humanity needed in order to carry out God's plan of salvation. Now this is something that is offensive to many people in the world today. They say, how is it that God could give up his only begotten son for his enemies, cause his death in order to save them? Why would such a father do such a thing? Christianity answers that because of his great love for us. God sacrificed his son, the only one who would do, in order to accomplish our salvation. Jesus had to be both true God and true man. And as Isaiah tells us in that verse, in verse 6, he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Three things that we learn about Jesus as our living stone. He is chosen by God. He is precious. And those who trust in him will not be put to shame. Imagine being a Hindu and standing before God's judgment seat on the last day. When God asks you what it is that is going to get you into heaven and you say, well, it's my good works and all of the good things that I've done. Imagine being a Muslim and standing before God's judgment seat on the last day and God asking you as a Muslim how it is that you think you are going to get into heaven and you say, well, because I've been a really good person and I've been obedient and I've kept the five pillars of Islam. Those religions will let those individuals down. They don't offer the solution for the problem of sin. Jesus alone, as the living stone, the cornerstone of the church, offers to humanity what we need as sinners. We will by no means be put to shame. As a Christian, standing before God on that final day, when we are asked, how is it that you think you can get into heaven? We don't need to say, well, look at how good I have been on this earth. Look at all of the things that I have done for humanity. We point to Jesus and we say, we know that we are going to get into heaven because Jesus has kept the law perfectly in my place and he has died to pay the debt of my sin. It is paid in full. Jesus is that cornerstone, that living stone that will not put us to shame. We will not be let down. Peter not only describes the cornerstone, Jesus as that living stone upon which the temple of God is built, but he also describes individual believers, those who put their trust in Jesus as also being living stones. In the second part of verse 4, Peter says, we come to Jesus as a living stone. And then verse 5, he says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Jesus didn't become the foundation, the cornerstone of the church, and give his life into death to accomplish our salvation so that we would remain dead in our trespasses and sins. 
He accomplished our salvation so that we too might become alive in him. That we might be living stones also built into the church of God, the Holy Christian Church. Peter says that we are built up a spiritual house. Each living stone, another block, another part of that holy Christian church created and accomplished by Jesus' work for us. Now there's another illustration that Peter brings out in these verses. We have the living stone, but he also describes us as a priesthood. If you think back to the priesthood of the Old Testament, the priests carried out a variety of different roles and responsibilities for God's people in the Old Testament. One of those responsibilities was to offer sacrifices on behalf of God's people. Take a look at verse 5 once again. Peter says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. If you go back into the Old Testament and you read about the priests of the Old Testament, you'll find that they will typically fall into two, get, two different categories. There were good priests, those who did the things that they were supposed to do. And on the other side of things, you have bad priests. Priests that used the office, the roles, the responsibilities of that office for their own personal benefit. We hear about individuals whom God struck dead in the temple as a result of being evil priests and not carrying out the duties that God had given to them. When Peter describes us as a priesthood, he doesn't just say any priesthood. He says we are a holy priesthood. And as part of this holy priesthood, part of our calling as living stones is to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Like the priests of the Old Testament, we also, as the New Testament priesthood, as individual Christians, we also offer up sacrifices, sacrifices to God. Now, as you think about that, you might ask yourself, what kind of sacrifices are we to offer in the New Testament time? We don't offer animal sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. We don't offer cows or goats or turtle doves. What kind of sacrifices does God require of us, desire of us as New Testament believers? Well, listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12. In the first verse of that chapter, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says that your lives, your lives are the sacrifices that we offer back to God as a result of being brought into his kingdom, made living stones and part of his kingdom, his church here on earth. Offer yourself, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I think about my young children. You give them a particular job to do, and you know what the first thing is that happens. Well, why do I have to do that? Why doesn't so-and-so have to do that? Why do I have to do it? And sometimes as Christians, or even just as human beings, we do the same thing. When God lays out what it is that he desires of us, we say, well, why should I have to do that? Why doesn't so-and-so have to do that? Why do I have to? Notice what the Apostle Paul says there. He says that giving our lives as a living sacrifice back to God as living stones, he says this is our reasonable service. This is completely reasonable. Just like taking out the trash. You live in this house. There's certain responsibilities that come with living in this house. As a living stone, there are certain responsibilities that God has given to us that's good for everybody else in the church and in the house. 
This is our reasonable service to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Peter tells us that there are those who reject Jesus as the living stone. They simply say, I don't want what Jesus has to offer. You think about the Hindu or the Buddhist or the Muslim. But there are also those who say, you know, I want what Jesus has to offer, but I don't want to be held accountable to his requirements. I don't like what he has to say about what that means for me in my life. I want to live my life my own way. And that's just as bad as the individual who says, I don't want what Jesus has to offer whatsoever. Gee, the Apostle Paul says this is what it is to be a part of his church, to be a living stone, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As holy priests in his church here on earth, not only do we have the privilege to give our lives back to God, to use our lives to His glory, but Peter also says that we have the privilege to proclaim His name to the world around us. In verse 9 of our text later on, Peter goes on and says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. Isn't that beautiful? What we have become, what Jesus has made us as living stones, a chosen generation, just as Jesus was chosen for a particular purpose, he says that each individual believer is also chosen, chosen by God. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people. And what is the purpose that this royal priesthood, this holy nation, this chosen generation has? Peter goes on, that you have become all of this, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Like the priests of the Old Testament, those priests of the Old Testament not only offered sacrifices on behalf of the people to God, but they were also in charge of the worship of the Old Testament. They led the singing, they directed the people as far as what was taking place within worship. And in a similar way, the Apostle Peter tells us that that is now our role as New Testament believers. We proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. But it's sad that sometimes when we think of worship, we limit it to what happens one hour a week on Sunday morning. When people ask, well, where do you worship? We say, well, I worship at Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church on 4th Avenue. We think of worship being confined to what happens on Sunday morning, as opposed to realizing that worship is an active part of every day and every hour of our life. We have been made this chosen generation, this holy priesthood, all so that we might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Worship isn't limited to what happens on Sunday morning. Worship is a part of the Christian's life. Every breath that is taken is an active part of worship as we proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Lord gives us different opportunities to carry that out in our lives and the different vocations and callings that he has given to us. As he gives us the opportunity to do that with our children when they are young or our grandchildren, with our co-workers, with our neighbor across the street, we have the privilege as a royal priesthood, 
of proclaiming the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Jesus didn't become the living stone, the God-man, in order for us to remain dead stones. He redeemed us so that we might become living stones, a holy priesthood, that we might offer a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, and that we might proclaim the praises of him who has called us out of darkness, given us mercy and made us part of his family, his people. We too have been chosen by God for that joyful service, our reasonable service as Christians. The Apostle Peter probably never saw those stones that grew and moved, but he knew about the church, the church that would continue to grow that would serve to proclaim those praises of Jesus, the cornerstone of the church throughout the ages. Jesus once told Peter that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Those living stones would continue to multiply as the Lord built up his church here on earth. We thank God that he has continued the building of his temple through living stones built upon Jesus Christ as the head, the cornerstone. And we thank God that he has, by faith, brought us into his family, into his people, made us priests that we might offer up sacrifices and proclaim his name while we have breath. May he continue to build up his church now and in the future until he finally returns in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 445. This hymn is found in the Christian warfare section of the hymnal. And it gets us to ask that question that Peter poses in the verses of our text about whether or not we are serving Christ in the capacity that he has called us to as living stones and part of his temple here on earth.
please rise for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, look upon our nation and behold our many needs. Do not, because of our sins, turn away from us, but rather be merciful and grant your help in all matters that distress us. Increase the faith of every Christian that we might not fall prey to the, the sins that have so badly eroded our society or give in to the many anti-Christian forces with, which boldly demand acceptance. Enable Christians by fearless profession of faith and godly lives to be guiding lights, leading others to glorify you, the only true God, Mommy. and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent to save us. Give all those who preach the gospel in this nation a double measure of your spirit, that they will not depart from the simple, saving message of the cross. Make your churches across this great land havens of rest for sin-wearied souls. We pray that you would turn many hearts from unbelief, sin, and false gods to the one and only Savior. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you would turn this nation from its false and vain philosophies, from its materialism, greed, selfishness, and moral corruption, from its general disregard for the honor of your name and the welfare of others. Bring down the violent and the lawless. Restrain those who plan insurrection and revolt. Root out and destroy terrorism wherever it is found. As the supreme ruler, grant health, safety, honesty, wisdom, fairness, and devotion of duty to all of those who are in authority. Give the ability and the will to rule well to our president and Congress, to the governors and legislators of our various states, to judges, magistrates, and law enforcement personnel. Give courage also to our courts to punish evildoers and to protect the innocent. Especially, we ask that you would bless those Christians who are serving in the armed forces. Keep them always in your love and protection. Through your Holy Spirit, strengthen their faith and avert whatever might prove harmful to their souls. Give whatever help is needed to carry out their, their appointed duties. Be with them in the lonely hours and keep them from sin. Spare them also, if it is your will, from service on the field of battle and protect them in the discharge of their duties. Finally, we ask that you would bring them safely home again to their families. We pray for all of this according to your gracious and good will. O oh, Father in heaven, forgive the sins of your people who cry unto you daily and help them to remain your children through faith in Christ. To this end, Fill them with the Holy Spirit and with His grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Mommy. Mommy. Receive with believing hearts the blessing and promise of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We'll conclude our service with the singing of verses 1 and 4 of the last hymn. Mommy,